I've only really passed, well, I've only passed through two churches. I've been here for almost 14 years. Uh, and then I was in California, my home state, for uh, 19 years pastoring a church I planted back in 89. Uh, and, uh, and so I've, I've learned a lot over the years of, of being a shepherd. Uh, and God has taught me much. Uh, and one a particular lesson of shepherding a church uh, happened at my last church when I was a young pastor in my early 30s. Uh, I started with a core group of about 19 people in a school uh, where we had to set up everything every Sunday morning, all the chairs, everything had to be set up. I didn't have, with 19 people, I didn't have a church pianist. Uh, I was the only guy who played the piano, so uh, I, I actually played, played piano and preached on the same Sunday. I was, it was, I'm so glad for these people uh, <laughs> and that I don't have to play the piano every Sunday. Um, literally, the, 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 the dowels that held the damper pedals on during the service on the piano would uh, pop off during the songs. And so we'd have to stop and the ushers would have come take the front of the piano off this old upright and, uh, and put the dowels back on the pedals so we could play. Isn't this totally different? I mean, I think it is. And uh, so planning a church, you know, when you're young and crazy, uh, and it was a huge thing. But uh, God, God blessed as we went along. We gained new people and uh, lost some people and gained new people. And I've been through all of that. Uh, one couple that we gained, uh, I was uh, real excited about. They, they had been Christian scientists, not the discipline, uh, but the, the cult. Uh, and they'd been a Christian scientist for many years, and they come to know Christ, and they came to the church, uh, and they were great people, uh, very uh, cordial, very intelligent, um, very uh, well-off uh, in many different ways. Uh, they were just a great addition to the church, or so I thought at the time. So since I was at a critical mass as planting a church, I saw them, I'm like, whoa, awesome. Uh, and it didn't take long to plug them into leadership. I now move slower when it comes to leadership after having been exposed to people like this. Um, they uh, had not left behind some of their false thinking. Uh, and so it didn't take long for, as, as they were plugged into leadership positions, for me to start hearing things from church parishioners who were like, have you considered what so-and-so is teaching? Uh, and it, w one case in point was the woman in question. Uh, she bought into the Messianic Jewish movement, of which I am pretty privy to since my wife comes from a Jewish background. Um, but there is a good side to it and a side that's erroneous. And they were uh, of the erroneous side that basically pitted um, uh, Jews against Christians, that you were really part of the enlightened group of the church if you were a Jew who, who wrapped uh, themselves around the Messiah. And the Gentiles were kind of like secondary citizens of the new church. All kinds of heretical doctrine was woven into this. They're almost like a, a modern-day Judaizer that Paul writes about in the book of Galatians. Uh, but that's who I had. And she began to push a book through the church. All the women started reading it. One day, a lady called me on my day off uh, and said, hey, I was outside working in the yard, shocking. Uh, and uh, I, she said, have you considered the book that this lady's passing around the church for the ladies to read? And I'm like, what book? And she said, I think you, I think you need to read it. And so I read it. And after I read it, uh, I realized it wasn't just a viewpoint. It was heretical doctrine. And so um, if they ever tell you being a pastor is an easy job, uh, reconsider. Um, it is a calling from God uh, because you have to shepherd sheep and you have to deal with wolves. Uh, and it's not always simple. Uh, so to protect the flock, I had to call that lady, right? So I called her, very cordial, very nice, and told her, hey, uh, the light of the book that uh, you're passing around, I've read it, I've studied it. I have, you know, two degrees in the Old Testament. What this guy is saying about the Old Testament is totally erroneous. It's heretical doctrine. I, I need to talk to you about that book. I don't want to talk about it. Oh, okay, well, I, I don't want that book taught in the church. Okay, I won't. Click. Uh, the, the relationship kind of disintegrated from that point. Um, and, but she didn't, she left the book behind and went on to another book for the ladies to read. But um, she continued her dissension type ways behind the scenes. Uh, eventually, the long and short of it is over a period of probably, I don't know, probably two years, uh, they eventually uh, took 106 people with them out of the church. That was painful because I only had 175 at the time. So I watched nine, it go from 19 to, you know, 50, awesome, you know, to 100, amazing, 175, we're rocking for God. And then half of them left with that lady and her husband uh, who had been working in the church to put, pit all those people against me and pastoral leadership. Um, when I say that I hold tenaciously the doctrine and I'm willing to hold on it, onto it to the point of death, I'm not kidding, because I was willing to lose more than half my church over who is Jesus. See, this is John. It's all about the argument of who Jesus is. Who is Jesus? Uh, and John's going to say to the churches in Asia Minor, you need to be, really understand who Jesus is because people have infiltrated the churches that he either planted or pastored in Asia Minor, 
which is now modern day Turkey. He said, you need to be clear on who Jesus is because in those churches, you have teachers masquerading as devout Christians teaching you doctrine that's total heresy. Truth matters, doesn't it? Uh, I watched God rebuild that church after I watched all those people leave, as sad as that was. God said, basically, since you stood for truth, I'll bless you again. And I watched God bring more people than that to the church over the next couple of years. Uh, but truth matters greatly. And John, as an old man, at this point in his life, he's probably around 90 years old. Uh, he's writing from his heart to these churches. He probably planted Ephesus. Uh, and the other churches like Philadelphia, Laodicea, Smyrna, Thyatira, etc., uh, probably received this letter, which doesn't have a typical, hi, this is from John, peace and love to you. He jumps right into doctrine about who Jesus is, because that's so important. So it's a cyclical letter that's being passed around to teach people about who Jesus is, uh, to, to bring them back to true doctrine and not uh, buying into the new progressive doctrine. We're going to call the opponents in this letter revisionists. In our terminology, you could call them progressives. Uh, people that are moving beyond old truths to more viable, palatable truths. Uh, they are revisionists because these doctrines bother people. We need to re rewrite them so they, they sound better and nicer. That's who he's facing, those kind of people. Uh, and when you leave sound doctrine uh, and you do it inside a church setting, um, it destroys the fellowship between the believers, Christians. Because I've, I've been there as a pastor, watching false doct doctrine inf infiltrate the church, and it creates haves and have-nots, and, and sides are opposing each other over doctrinal things, uh, and it creates great dissension and, and, and wipes out church unity. It also wipes out a person's walk with God because you're so at odds with other people, you have a hard time having this intimate walk with Jesus, especially if you don't really understand who he is because of what's being told to you by an opposing group. So John's letter written many, many years ago, you're going to see basically a one-to-one -one correspondence in the day in which we live because the devil doesn't come up with new stuff. He takes the same old stuff repackages it with new words for the modern group, the revisionist, and they think it's the new truth and they bring it into the church and they divide and, and destroy churches. Um, we need to be clear on what this little book is about. It's a short book, only a, a few verses. Take you a few minutes to read it. But as you look at this particular book, I'm going to show you the, what I think is the main idea of the first four verses, the prologue of the book, where he's going to talk about truth because truth matters. He's going to say truth about who Jesus is should impact your life. It should impact your human relationships and your, your, your divine relationships with the Trinity. See, the more I understand the Trinity and who Jesus is, then that logically should translate in how do I treat other people? Because if I'm a Christian and I know Jesus and have an intimate walk with him, I'm going to want to be the hands and feet of Jesus to everybody in my life. So these two things hang together, understanding who Jesus is and then understanding how that knowledge then filters out into, well, how do I think about other Christian people? How do I think about the lost? So this is a the main motif of the first opening verse, what we would call the prologue. And I'm going to tell you, this book is an interesting little book. Um, the other day before I left on the plane, I was going through a filing cabinet in my office, and I have a bunch of them. And I came, and I have stacks of notebooks from notes from, you know, all the 12 years of school that I went to after high school, just notebooks from classes and stuff. And I found an old one. I mean, an orange, orange has got to be old, and an old orange notebook. Pulled it out, opened it up, and it was, it was my translation of the book of 1 John from Greek when I was 17. Wow, I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Because back then you couldn't cut and paste Greek. You had to write it. <laughs> now you just cut and paste. It's totally a piece of cake. Back then you had to, so it was my writing of the entire book and my translation of the entire book when I was 17. It was amazing to go back and look at some of my insights and stuff. I'm a little older now, um, 64. So the things I understand about 1 John, I've moved on and God's taught me much. But what I will say to you is this book is written by an old man like a grandfather. And you have a grandfather? And when you sit down and talk with a grandfather, they don't usually speak in a linear fashion with a goal in mind. Do they? It's like grandpa's kind of off on a rabbit trail. You know, I know, mom, is he ever going to come back to what he was? I don't think so, honey. Now, because that's how they talk, isn't it? I'm a grandpa now. I get it. So think of this book, instead of a linear argumentation like a Pauline epistle, where he's going to talk about justification by faith and prove it to you and give you all the evidence, this is more like your grandpa's talking to you uh, at church, and he's going to talk about this concept, and then he's going to drift to that concept, and then he's going to spiral down to another concept, and then he's going to go back over to what he talked about earlier, and you're going to, wait, 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 didn't we, didn't we, just, didn't we just talk about that? Mm-hmm. Just let him talk. He's just his grandpa. And then he's going to circle around. The whole book is like that. So I would say, just from a preaching perspective, this is not a simple book to preach, because I'm a linear 
person, right? Point A to point B. This is like point A to B to back to A to C to Z. To, it's all over the place. So if you think I'm kind of drifting all over the place over the next few months, it's not me, okay? <laughs> it's John, all right? So be gracious and merciful unto me. Wow, thanks for the support. So thank you. Okay, so he's writing this to counter revisionists in his churches that are destroying the, the joy of those churches. In fact, if you flip over to 1 John chapter 2, uh, verse 18, notice what he says here how kindly he speaks to the church. Dear children, he's talking to his church. He's 90, you know, dear children. This is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it's the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going um, showed that none of them really belonged to us. Who's he talking about? The revisionist? Those people who were teaching false doctrine in the church, whom he, he encountered them and confronted them, and they eventually left the church in a huff and took their entourage with them. I've totally been there. So was John a successful pastor? Yeah, yeah. Do you know that successful pastors face great opposition? Been there, done that. So if you were, a, I've been there, a pastor of a small church facing great opposition, it doesn't mean you're a failure. It just means you're teaching the word of God and the devil can't stand it will teach. See, what John's going to do is he's going to show you two things in, this, in these opening verses where he tells you why he wrote the book. He's going to tell you, number one, there's a path of Christological truth. I mean, that was what was under attack in their churches. Who is Jesus? So he's going to counter the Gnostics of the day, the people with the inside knowledge of what is really good doctrine. Uh, Gnostic, not, Gnostic teaching, we'll get into in great detail in a minute, uh, it comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means to know. So if you have the special knowledge that we do, you're enlightened. You're part of our special little group over here in the church. Those other people that don't embrace what we know, eh, they're kind of lesser spiritual people. So how does he address them? Verse one, he says, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have beheld and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, it's a code word for Jesus, and the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you that the eternal life, speaking of Jesus, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. This is, this is kind of a weird way to start a book, isn't it? No, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, write to you, you know, love, joy, peace, etc. No, none of that. He jumps right into four relative clauses. Don't you love relative clauses? Oh, no. It is a relative clause. He starts out with what, 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 what? Four times. But he's talking about who, 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 who? Why? If you're sitting at your desk analyzing this and you're trying to study it, okay, you identify there's four relative clauses. Why didn't he start with who, why, what, what? Because what is a neuter? And a neuter is going to show the immensity of the work of Christ. And he's not going to focus on anything other than that. He wants to talk about the whole work of Christ. So he says to this church that doesn't really quite understand who Jesus is, let me explain to you, like in a giant umbrella fashion, the, the massive nature of who Jesus is with four relative clauses. But before we actually dig into that, uh, this is still my introduction. <laughs> we, we need to understand the setting of the book in more detail. I already talked about it two weeks ago. If you weren't here, go back and watch it online. Uh, we need to drill down more into what was going on in Asia Minor in that day and time. Because if you do not understand what was going on, you cannot interpret the book. You have to understand what he was up against. So bear with me as we drill down to, into what he faced uh, as a pastor, and you're going to find it's much the same kind of thing that we face today. So what he faced, uh, this Gnostic teaching, uh, was totally uh, off on what they thought about Jesus. Barclay, William Barclay, says this about that type of thinking back in that day. Quote, the belief of all Gnostics in their thinking was that only the spirit was good and that matter, the material world, was essentially evil. The Gnostics, therefore, inevitably, they despised the world since it was matter, in particular, they despised the body, which being matter was necessarily evil. Imprisoned within the body was the human spirit. That spirit was the seed of God and was altogether good. So the aim of life must be to release this heavenly seed imprisoned in this evil body. That could be done only by secret knowledge uh, that they would know in their church and an elaborate ritual which only the true Gnostics could supply. Here was the train of thought which was run, ran deep into Greek thinking and which was not even now ceased to exist in our day and time, as I'm going to show you. Uh, it's, it's the basic conviction that all matter is evil and the spirit is good, and that the one real aim in life is to liberate the human spirit from the prison house called the body. 
let's translate this into modern terms. The mind is what matters, not what the body is. Mind is the most important thing. The inner thing is the most important thing. The body is the, well, we can just do what we want with it. Transgenderism. What's it do? Same thing. Mind, body, bifurcation. Why? The, well, the mind can look at the body, which is physical, and override the physical features to come up with a new gender. See? It's the same stuff. Just repackaged on a different day. And so Gnostic thinking, this bifurcation between the mind and the body, is well, when all throughout philosophical systems, if you go back and study, you will see it. I did it in my doctoral dissertation um, on said subject. So um, I've been all through this, and John says, I was facing it, and you're facing it even today, and it's being brought into churches, teaching that teaches wrong concepts about theology, about what God said. It's ancient Gnosticism. But the, the mind, the spirit is great, but the body, well, we, we need to get away from it. So what, when you apply this thinking to Jesus, it led to two viewpoints. Docetist, uh, docaine, which means to something that seems to be. Docetists in the church would say, well, Jesus wasn't really fully God and man. Uh, he was uh, just, uh, uh, well, not a, there was no real body there. So there was one book called uh, the Acts of John. It's an apocryphal book written in 160 AD that said when Jesus walked across sand, you wouldn't see his footprints. Was he like Air Jordan? Just kind of, whoa, man. He's just floating. No, 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 no. He wasn't just floating along. They would say that those Christians would say, well, he didn't really have a flesh and blood body. Uh, that was one viewpoint that came into the church. The other one was uh, outright Gnosticism. Um, there's a, a church scholar named Eusebius uh, who wrote from 260 to 339 AD, uh, and he wrote a book called Ecclesiastical History. Uh, and in uh, the, the fourth section of his book, uh, the section 14, verse 6, uh, he recounts that when John showed up at a bathhouse to get a bath, uh, which the men would do, uh, a man named Serinthus showed up, and Serinthus was a Gnostic teacher that opposed John and, and perverted the teaching of Jesus. And John said, I will not even be in the same house with Serinthus until John left. And Barclay goes on to say this. He says, Serinthus, this Gnostic teacher, drew a definite distinction between the human Jesus and the divine Christ. He said that Jesus was a man born in a perfectly natural way. He lived in special obedience to God. And after his baptism, the Christ, uh, the anointed one, the divine part, in the shape of a dove descended on him uh, and from that power, which is above all powers. And then he brought the news of the father who up to that point had been unknown. Serenthus uh, did not stop there, he says. He said that at the end of Jesus' life, the, uh, the Christ again withdrew from him so that the Christ never suffered at all. It was the human Jesus who suffered and died and rose again. Huh? Did Jesus have a real body of flesh and blood? Yeah, yeah. What does Serenthus and the Gnostics say? Well, do, well, if you're a docetist, he just seemed to have a body. He didn't really have one. And if you were a Gnostic, well, well, okay, so he was in a body, but, but the divine part of his nature came down at his baptism and then left him when it came to his, his crucifixion. So the God-man did not die. Just the physical body. False doctrine brought into the church. Uh, this is what John was up against. It created two camps in the church. One camp who said, you're with us in our revised theology that has a better understanding of Jesus. And the other camp that held on tenaciously to the old doctrines about Jesus that created great problems in the church. Uh, Barclay goes on to say, the aim of Gnosticism, as, as with all false teaching, is to release, he says here, the pneuma, the spirit, from the soma, the Greek word for body. But that release could only be won by a long, arduous study, which only the intellectuals who had time on their hands could ever undertake. You know, if you're a part of our church and you're part of our new revisionist thinking about, you know, this new doctrine, then you're in the know. And, and, and this is, this is, this, God's gonna bless you. But we have the special insight. We have new terminology and everything to understand all this. And these people over here, they don't, they don't really understand who Jesus is. We, we do. The, the result was really clear what happened in those churches in Asia Minor. Chaos, dissension, argumentation, uh, broken relationships, no peace. So you show me a church that has uh, internal chaos, and a lot of it comes back to sound doctrine versus doctrine saying it's sound. And John says, I have to, I have to tell you, uh, I have to write against this. This is why he jumps right in in the first four verses uh, and mends us no words with what I need to write to you about. So with that background stuff in mind, let's, uh, let's actually get into the sermon. Are you with me? Still with me? So think about this. Um, he's, going to, he's going to say here, um, uh, I, I want to counter the, the false thinking of the day. 
See, and this is similar to our day. Don't, don't think it doesn't apply today. I was reading a, a, a statistical study uh, that's a new study by George Barna. Uh, it's called the American Worldview Inventory of 2022. Uh, and in this particular worldview, here's what Barna says about Americans. It says, it seems that most preteen parents are unaware or certainly unfazed by the contradiction by, between calling themselves Christian but living in ways that repudiate the teachings of Jesus and the principles of the Bible. That's the truth. He then says, the polling reveals that not only are a majority of our parents millennials, uh, but that 94% of parents of preteens possess a worldview known as syncretism. He says, that is a blending of multiple worldviews, which no single life philosophy is dominant. Isn't that the truth? I'm from California. I just came from California. I can tell you, they blend them together. Why? Well, man, there's no truth. There's just truths, and we just need to pick and choose and wed them together, and there it is, man. Uh, I submit to you a conversation I had after the wedding. Are you ready? So Liz's brother, uh, who's not a pastor, nor is he a Christian, had a, did a wedding at his house for all of his you know, 60 to 70-year-old friends, and, and uh, we didn't go to that, but we went to the party the next day, big party, Winnebago's everywhere. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm not kidding. Winnebago's everywhere, four-wheel drives, all that kind of stuff. And like I told Liz, it's like when we're walking, I'm like, we don't feel like we really belong with this crowd, you know? I mean, it was a different kind of crowd. And I'm like, you could get high just walking around, you know? And so, you know, biker types, tattoos everywhere. I mean, it was a different kind of party. And then there I am, you know? Uh, and, <laughs> and so later in the day, uh, Liz and I were in the kitchen uh, and uh, one of her friends that she grew up with, uh, he's probably 68, 69 years old, uh, walked up, I hadn't seen her in many, many years, and we were talking to him, uh, and I didn't, I didn't know the guy, you know, she introduced me and stuff, and so we're talking, and um, he didn't know what I did for a living, because he doesn't know me, so I'm just listening, I'm chilling, man, I'm just trying to fit in, you know, and um, <laughs> here's how the conversation kind of went, I'll just summarize it for you, to understand syncretism, right, the blending of belief systems, uh, so we're just talking, and he's like, hey, you know, I never believe in God, you know, but hey, but I do now, I'm thinking, hey, praise God, and um, he said, yeah, I had a bicycle wreck. I used to make my own bikes. I welded them together, two really cool stuff. And I was you know, going in the mountains and I went off a jump and the, my front forks bent on me, ejected me through the air, landed on my face. You know, uh, Boy Scouts found me in the trail. They brought in a helicopter. I got, <laughs> got in the gurney. I'm flying you know, back to San Diego. And he goes, man, all of a sudden I, was, I saw lights. Oh, cool. And I saw numbers multiple numbers, man. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. What about it? That's why I believe in God, man. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> where do you even start? I mean, it's like, oh my gosh, you know? And uh, so I go, well, tell, you know, tell me more. You know, he goes, I never believed there was evidence for God, but now I know there's evidence because there's God. The numbers are everywhere. And then he looks at the clock on the wall. He goes, there's there. There could be messages in those numbers. Huh? I'm like, What's, what are you drinking? I mean, um, and so, you know, so, so he goes, I'm into numerology. I'm studying numbers, man. They're so educational and I'm studying numbers. And I, so you're into Jewish gematra thinking, whoa, dude, you know about that? Mm, yeah. How do, how do you know about that? You're one of us? Well, no, not really. Uh, I, I just have a degree in Hebrew. So yeah. Oh, whoa. Hey, cool, man. But um, he said, you know, uh, I'm getting into the numbers and the numbers are telling me the world's coming to an end. Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah, he goes, this, this time zone is going to me mesh with the new time zone, and it's going to be a time of total peace. And I go, well, peace is coming, because uh, Jesus talked about this. Uh, he prophesied concerning this. Whoa, Jesus. He just, he's like, man, I'm totally not into that. <laughs> I'm like, really? I said, well, I can give you the evidence as, as to why Jesus is somebody you should listen to. Hey, 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 hey I'm into astrology, man. I'm studying the numbers, I'm studying the stars, I'm studying everything. I mean, everybody but Jesus, right? See what I mean? This is syncretism. And that was how the conversation went. It's synch I'll, I'll pick all these things, even though they're diametrically opposed to each other, and I'll lump it into my new belief system. Don't bother me with that Jesus stuff. That's syncretism. You, if you do not think Gnostic thinking is alive and well, you better rethink it. Or come with me to the next wedding in San Diego. But, <laughs> so this is, this is people today. But there is absolute truth. See, see, even an agnostic who says, I don't know, the A of the agnostic is an alpha privative, wedded to gnosis, gnosis, agnosis, gnosis, gnosticism. It means I have no knowledge. 
Well, he at least has knowledge his agnosticism is true. You follow me? Did you hear me? So anyway, moving on to my sermon. We got to get to the verses. Verse one. <laughs> what did John say? In light of all of that, he jumps right in and says, well, what was from the beginning, what we've heard, what we've seen, our eyes have beheld. We told you about it. Well, what was from the beginning? Well, if you're reading your Bible and you're reading John and know he wrote the gospel of John, this should like trigger something in your brain going, in the beginning. Whoa, this sounds very familiar, doesn't it? What did he say in John 1.1? 1, 1? In the beginning was the word, and the word was, was who? Who is the word? Jesus. And he wasn't a God. Joe is witness thinking, which is ancient Gnostic thinking. He wasn't a God. He's God, God in the flesh. So he said, from the very beginning, John says, let me tell you, we were with him and we knew him from the very beginning. He was God in the flesh, not some docetic view of God, not some Gnostic view of God. It was from day one, God. Imagine, from the very beginning. And Jesus said this in John 3. Uh, Jesus said in John 3, 13 and verse 31, that he descended from the Father. And it wasn't like what the Gnostic said. Well, the divine one came down to you at the baptism. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, no, no, I came from the Father and was born this God man. Uh, in John 8, 58, when the Pharisees want to know who Jesus is, when he blows their mind by telling them, before Abraham was, I am. They're like, whoa, you're only in your 30s, man. How could you be, to how could you, huh? It, <laughs> it blew him away because he's saying, I was before Abraham. Well, do the math. That was probably about 2,500 years before Jesus was born. And they're looking at him going, he's, he, he's high on something. I don't know. I mean, there's no way. And Jesus says, no, before Abraham was, I am. Who is Jesus? He's the great I am of history. That's what he says. I am the I am. And John says, from the very beginning, we knew the I am had been born. We were with him. Then he goes on to say, I want to write to you about what we have heard. I mean, could you imagine going to a Bible study with Jesus? Could you imagine what we have heard? Think, any theological question you want to ask, there he is. I mean, there he is. Was the flood worldwide? Was there really a, an explosion that created everything, time and space and everything? I mean, how many angels can, no, don't ask him that one. You know, I mean, he, he says, we have heard. Think about what he heard. Okay, so when Jesus is going around the Sea of Galilee, he just said a couple of words to his disciples to call them to be his disciples. He's the rabbi forming his new rabbinical team to his disciples. Um, and he goes around, and he just says two things to him. What does he say to him? Follow me. Would you change your whole life direction if some Jewish guy walked by you and told you that? Well, if it was Jesus, you probably would because there was something about him, the look in his face, the demeanor of his leadership body, things you had heard about him already, that you're like, man, he's calling me to drop everything and follow him no matter where it goes. And they did. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 21, notice this. It says, and going on from there, after he called two disciples to follow him, it says he saw two other brothers, other names, James, the son of Zebedee. He had a brother. His brother's name was John. Where were they? Uh, well, they were in the boat with Zebedee, their father. What were they doing? Men in their nets, they're fishermen. And he called to them. It doesn't say what he called to them, but he called to them. He probably said, hey, John, hey, James, come follow me. And immediately they argued and discussed and talked with their dad. And hey, dad, is this a good time for us to leave the business? Can you handle it? I mean, did they, what, what does it say? They immediately left the boat and their father and followed them. And you don't read anything here about the dad going, where are you guys going? I can't even pick up the net by myself. No, dad's like, Go, go with Jesus. What did they hear? They heard those audible words from Christ to follow me. And looking into the face of the God man, they left everything to follow him. Amazing. That's what they heard. And then straight away, they heard him teach. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23 says, and uh, they were with him. Jesus was going around all the Galilee, teaching in their synagogues uh, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And this is the amazing part healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. <laughs> Nothing stopped him, disease-wise. Didn't matter what it was. So they heard him teach, and they must have thought to themselves, no one has taught biblical truth like this guy. Nobody. Well, imagine the word, God, is talking to you, teaching you. They, they heard that. And then they, they verified that he was God in the flesh because they watched him do miracles. Like what? Like what kind of miracles? Because anybody could say they're God, right? Sure. You would want them to show you 
Like, show me your God. So he did. He said, okay, I'll show you miracles. So what did he do? How did he, how'd he prove it? Well, let's see. What was the very first one? He was at a wedding. They ran out of wine. Terrible thing. I don't drink wine, but I can imagine. This would be terrible. So he, he created gallons of wine in those vats. Turned water to wine. Okay, that would do it for me. What else did he do? That's it? He rose the dead. He healed the lame, the leprous. I mean, you, you name it. It was not a problem. And he did, I mean, sometimes he would take dirt, spit in it, make balls of mud, and stick it on somebody's eyes that couldn't see, and they would pull it off, and boom, they could see. I mean, he did it in a variety of ways that only God could do. So after a while, you would think, I mean, and Greg talked about, by the way, thank the Lord for uh, Greg bringing the word last week. Uh, we sat and watched the sermon out of San Diego, but he's talking about Jesus walking on the water. I fished a lot of lakes. I've never seen that one. I mean, if you're in a storm and you see Jesus walking at you, I mean, if you're a disciple, aren't you going to say, he's the man. If he can walk on the water, he's got to be God. So he said, we have seen him from the very beginning and we have heard him speak. And boy, everything that he has said and everything he has done tells us that this is God in the flesh, not some spirit, but God himself. And he says also, we've, we've beheld him. He said, our hands have handled the word of life. I mean, Jesus is the essence of eternal life. He's the only one who can give it to you. And he says, we have actually been with him every day. Could you imagine? Uh, James and John, they had some baggage, didn't they, as brothers? As all siblings do. Their baggage was, they were, they were nicknamed sons of thunder. Why? They had anger management issues. I mean, if you're going to see somebody get into fight, it's going to be them. You're going to see somebody go off half-cocked instantly, it's going to be them. It, they're just, they, they just, they had, no one here suffers with anger management issues, but they had them, and, and Jesus, he chose them. What's this tell you about Jesus? He takes broken, dysfunctional people and uses them to his glory. That's all of us. And he says, man, he, 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 chose, he chose us to be his to be his disciples. We, we were with him every day. And when we would have an outburst of anger as brothers and, and start fighting among ourselves and, and get the disciples to fight among themselves, I mean, I can remember when Jesus he came over and put his arm around me, John, say, hey, John, you know, that is just not how we roll as Christians. You know, I mean, that's just not, that's not okay. You know, and could you imagine Jesus putting his arm around you when you had an angry outburst? When you just like repent and confess right there? I mean, he, he said, we were with him every day, shaking hands. I mean, we saw him. He was no docetic phantom. It, this was God in the flesh. Show me a, a church that uh, has great unity, and I'll show you a church that uh, knows who Jesus is. Because they know him, and then they, they follow him. He says in verse 2, the, his life was manifested. We've seen and we bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. He said, not only did, did the God men walk among us, uh, he's the essence of eternal life, and he was with the Father prior to his birth. Why? He's the second member of the Trinity. See, John starts out with great theology and tells you, I was an eyewitness. I saw this happen. I mean, are you going to believe a witness who tells you, yeah, you know, yeah, I heard about that wreck, you know, through, well, a lady that was at Starbucks told me what she saw, but it wasn't, really wasn't what she saw because a cousin told her, and a cousin, you know, well, she didn't really see it. You know, it was a, you know, a friend of hers that she met at a giant grocery store. Huh? Are you going to believe that? I mean, why are you laughing? I mean, would you believe? No, you're going to believe that. But if the person, I was there, I saw it. I saw it. You know, like when Liz's uh, dad's brother was on the Oklahoma when it was sunk by the Japanese on December the 7th, to sit down and talk to Harold. He was an eyewitness. And the first time I talked to Harold, I'm like, Harold, what happened on that Sunday morning? What was it like? I was spellbound as a young man listening to Harold, a chief petty officer, talk about there was all kinds of commotion going on up deck. I had to check it out. I raised the hatch and couldn't believe what I saw. I can't question him and doubt it because he was there. You know what I'm saying? John says, no, we saw him. We saw him every day. He's a firsthand witness. So who is Jesus? God, man in the flesh. He's still God, man in the flesh today. Uh, and anybody that wants to teach you likewise teaches you false doctrine. Uh, and the devil has infiltrated many churches in our country with false teaching, whether it's a false teaching about Jesus, false teaching about salvation, false teaching about the word of God, to get you to move away from truth. And when you move away from truth, you move away from the one uh, who gives you peace in your life and the one who can bring peace between you and other people. So 
the doctrine is going to be heavy in this book from this eyewitness. The second thing he says is, let me stop and just tell you why I'm writing this letter. Notice, notice what he says. This is the purpose of that Christological truth. He tells you the path of it. This was God, the man born in the flesh and walked among us. And then he's going to tell you, well, why am I writing about him? Uh, he's going to tell you in verses three to four. He says, uh, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also. And then notice, um, see that little word uh, after the first comma, that? See that word, that? Uh, probably help if I use it. Uh, see that? Uh, so that is called a henna clause in Greek. So henna clause, H-I-N-A, uh, you have two options. It can either be purpose or result. Uh, it's not result because he's telling you the purpose of my book, not the result of my book. He's telling you the purpose of my book. So he says, I, I, I'm writing to you that you, purpose one, may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father. That's his first purpose. And it doesn't show it in the English text, but there's another one of those henna clauses in this, this thing over here. And so what he's going to tell you is two things why I'm writing. Number one, he says, I'm writing... Uh, that you might uh, um, have a rich fellowship with us and that you, you might have a rich fellowship with Jesus. This is the key word to the entire book. Some people wrongly think the book was written to verify whether you're a Christian or not. That is not why he wrote the book. He wrote the book because the church was under attack by false teachers and was clouding their thinking. And so he wants to push back against that false teaching and restore Christian fellowship among the Christians and, and fellowship with Jesus He's writing to that end. That's why he says what he does. I'm writing uh, what he says so that, that you may have fellowship with us as Christians, that we won't argue and fight over who Jesus is, and that indeed our fellowship is with the Father. And, and so he says, I want you to have this rich fellowship that we have as dis disciples with Jesus, and that that rich fellowship might translate over into your church. What pastor wouldn't want that? A church that's in love with Jesus, who's then in love with each other, where there's peace. Why does our church enjoy much unity? Well, because we understand who Jesus is, and that translates into, well, we have great love for each other because we understand who Jesus is. His, his second purpose was this. He says, I also wrote uh, these things so that uh, our joy may be complete. Not, this is kind of weird. If you think about it, why didn't he say that your joy may be complete? He's, he's writing about himself. I, I, I'm writing as the pastor of your churches, so that my joy may be made complete. Was he egotistical? Uh, no. How old is he? Probably in his 90s. Remember who is he? Grandpa. What's he telling you? Honey, sit down. Let me tell you my heart. As an old pastor, he said, one of the greatest things I could ever have as a pastor of churches is that I know that you embrace sound doctrine about Jesus. And that then translates into a great relationship with him and a great relationship with other people. That makes me happy. Uh, when I first translated this book when I was 17, I could not say I, was a, I wasn't a pastor, nor was I old. Although when you're 17, you're thinking you know everything, correct? Yeah, right? Yeah. Um, but now that I'm 64 and I look at it, I could probably say, well, I'm an old pastor, right? You won't offend me. I'll pray for you, but... <laughs> because when I look at it now, I think, you know, Lord, um, you know, I was an older man, an older Christian, and a pastor... What, what do I really want from the church? I mean, there's many things that I want as a pastor, but what, what do I want? Well, I want what John wants. That I hear that you love Jesus intimately. You have a great confessional life with him, a great rich life with him. You can't wait to talk to him in the morning. Can't read, read, read his word to ask how it applies to you. I mean, he radically changes your life because you have a rich relationship with him. If I hear that about you, that, that, hey, that's all I need. And then when I hear that that relationship with Jesus spills over into all your relationships, and that if you know people with anger management issues that are Christians that are struggling, you still love them anyway, don't you? And, you, and, and there's that great forgiveness and there's great unity because you care about each other. I mean, if you have that kind of rich fellowship between you and Jesus and other Christians, that I accomplished my goal. He says, uh, I'm writing that our joy as disciples might be full when we hear great things about you. Um, he was watching those churches being destroyed. That's the hardest thing to watch. When I watched those people leave my last church, that was an extremely emotionally gut-wrenching thing to watch. But then I watched God bless it with many new people to come back after those people left. See, John's saying, this is hard for me to watch. I just want you to love each other. So you're going to find he's going to talk about love all throughout this book. Because what's the devil want to do? Create disunity and chaos, and everybody's fighting among themselves. And John says, no. My greatest joy is to hear that you have rich fellowship with each other. 
That's my prayer for you. It's a prayer for me. And it's my prayer for the church at large. Why don't you stand? If you haven't read the book, that's just the prologue. So next week, we're going to finish chapter one. Uh, but I encourage you to read that little book. It only takes about maybe 10 minutes and get it into your heart and mind. Let's pray. God, thank you uh, for the word fellowship. Uh, it's such a rich term. It's going to be woven all throughout this book. Uh, it's the very thing the devil attacks. It's the very thing that you prayed that we would have uh, in your high priestly prayer in John 17, that we would have unity among ourselves. And unity uh, spills over into fellowship. And so we pray you would help safeguard our fellowship with you, that it would be rich, it would be sweet. And we pray for our fellowship among each other, that we would be a church that would continue uh, to love each other as you would uh, love us had you were walking among us. May we reflect you. And we pray that that love might uh, be translated into uh, a great testimony of the gospel to those who don't know the Christ. And we just pray that the, this study might transform us in ways that we have not thought about before into a deeper walk with you. And may many people at the end of this study come to know you as the Christ, the true God-man who went to the cross for each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good to have you. And God bless you, and have a great week.